Professor Giro, welcome to Holland. Oh, thank you. Welcome to the Netherlands. Uh, have you ever been to the Netherlands, by the way? Yes, yes. W when was that? 30 years ago. 30 years ago. So what, 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 what was the occasion? I was just traveling through Europe. All right, just traveling through Europe. So uh, when you think of the Netherlands, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Oh, the first thing that comes to mind is a society that has a sense of the welfare state, that in, in some fundamental way believes in democracy and uh, uh, has a passion for music and for life. Okay. Well, that sounds uh, that sounds fair. That sounds reasonable. <laughs> well, um, I wrote to you because I am on a mission to make education um, a bit better because it needs revision, to my opinion. And uh, I think your work, especially your work in critical pedagogy, can um, is is a part of the solution, and the way uh, and the, the works of Paulo Freire. So these two books are central uh, in our interview uh, today. Um, so my goal is to talk about the past, the present, and the future of critical pedagogy. But before we get there. Um, let's uh, talk about the present just for for a bit. I was wondering how has the Corona crisis um, affected your uh, private life and your professional life as a teacher, as a professor? Well, I mean, as 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 in my private life, I mean, it it uh, like anything else, you know, it imposes forms of self isolation that it, it seems to me intensifies and makes very clear. The need for human connections. Uh, you know, we live in a, a new world that says that basically anything you should be concerned about is your own self-interest. And I think that what the virus has revealed how, is how false that is, and how cruel it can be, and how inhuman it can be. Yeah. And that, in many ways, uh, uh, my private life uh, seems to make clear to me how relevant that is. How relevant is the need for connections, for, for community, for you know, caring, for being compassionate, uh, for being concerned about the, the larger social order, you know, and, and being concerned about the common good. I think in, in, in my teaching, uh, it's very difficult because it, you know, teaching has always been plagued by a kind of instrumental rationality, and I think that what the the COVID crisis has done is really pushed in a remarkable way the discourse back about 50 years. Because it seems to me that all we can talk about now are methods, Zoom, team, mm. uh, you know, the technology has overridden in many ways the, the most important assumptions about democracy. And that is, I mean, about education. And that is, how does education function uh, to enhance the public good? How does it function to create citizens who are critical, self-reflective, compassionate, responsible? Those questions have taken have become somewhat subordinate to more technical, in, instrumental questions. Exactly. In fact, technology is presented as the salvation, uh, yes. uh, the solution to the big problem. It's, it's because of off technology that students are still are, are able to attend some colleges. But that's a false hope, according to you. I, 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 I think that we have to be careful in, in making the claim that there are benefits for technology as opposed to elevating technology to a, 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 a place where it becomes the bedrock for, for, for judging everything that we do. And I, I mean, I have no trouble with arguing with people that are recognizing or acknowledging that, pe that technology can, for instance, be useful in medicine in, 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 with kids who are in rural areas to have access to, you know, mm -hmm. to knowledge that they ordinarily wouldn't have. That's fine. But I think that when that model becomes the baseline for how we talk about education, uh, I think we've, we've really gone down a very dark path. I think that uh, that's the antithesis of education to me, critical education. And how has your education practice changed since the beginning of the crisis? Because I can imagine you, it was first all about physical education being present in front of a classroom, and that has changed. How has it changed your practice, and what has it done to your students? How has well, it affected them? It hasn't changed my practice a lot because I've been on sabbatical. Uh, and, and I don't start teaching. I start teaching online in January. 
and we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I, I think that it's very clear for, to me, you know, being an observer of education and seeing how these debates are emerging, that a lot of teachers are very frustrated. A lot of students are very frustrated. A lot of parents are very frustrated. Not because they aren't concerned about the virus or not concerned about medical con considerations, but concerned because all of a sudden we realize that the school uh, inhabits an amazingly useful and socially important space. I mean, kids are able to interact with each other. They learn something about the social. There's an element of joy in those modes of communications. Teachers can use their body language. They can touch. They can be compassionate. They're not just automatons, you know, sort mm -hmm. of flicking, uh, so to speak. I mean, they're not just flicking on, in a screen culture. And I think that all of these things enhance and magnify uh, a note, the relationship between, for instance, critical pedagogy and the importance of the social, the importance of social relations and how they work. Uh, and so I, you know, I, 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 I've been disturbed about the way that argument has gone. The, the other side of this is that there are many teachers who are being forced into the classroom when they have enormous medical problems and have to retire. And I, and I think that early, and I, and I think that what this suggests also is that in the midst of this crisis, we're learning something about how little control teachers have over the conditions of their own labor. So this is not simply a medical issue. This is a political issue. Mm -hmm. It's not simply a political issue. It's a pedagogical issue. And so we need to understand that there are a number of pandemics at work here. You know, this is not just a medical pandemic. Yeah. It's a political pandemic. It's a pandemic about power. It's a pandemic about control over the conditions of one's labor, about unions, uh, about the resources that schools have. Think about it. For the first time, all of a sudden, we're talking about how schools need enormous resources to protect students from getting the virus. Well, schools have been underfunded in the United States for the, since the 1980s in ways that have basically destroyed much of public education. But that notion of funding doesn't get talked about. It's only in the midst of a medical emergency does the question of funding now become important. So we need we need a more comprehensive understanding of what all this means. You were, uh, 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 you said it started in the 80s, this process. Um, you think it started when um, the it was a nation report, it was called A Nation at Risk. Yeah. Um, what has that report done to education? Oh, I think it basically has defined education in ways that are utterly ridiculous, uh, inhuman, instrumental, and, and seems to suggest that any failing in the larger public sphere is a result of the failing of public education. Mm -hmm. When in fact, the larger public sphere bears down on education in ways that underfunds it, that privatizes it, that defines it in utterly instrumental terms, and basically destroys it. Uh, I, I, I think that what we saw with the nation at risk was the beginning of the end of public education as a public good. It's very. Um, I, I'm. Um, I was going to ask about um, about Trump, but I'm not gonna because everybody asks about Trump and uh, the coming uh, and the election. But um, somehow, when I see your interviews, it's always about America, and yet you live in Canada. I, yeah. It's very rarely that you talk about Canadian politics, about Canadian education. Somehow people that interview you always entice you, seduce you to talk about American politics. But what about, let's change the subject to Canadian politics. How is, especially to the field of education, how is Canada doing at the moment? Canada's amazing I mean, in many ways. I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I think the Canadian educational system is very fair, with the exception of indigenous students uh, who, who have been excluded, of course. <laughs> yeah. in, in, but it's a very different perception of education. Education here is seen as something that's instrument that's essential to civic culture. It's linked to the to questions about democracy. It's linked to citizenship. It's linked to literacy. When I taught in the U.S. Many of my students, even graduate students, could not write. They could not write. They had a lot of trouble writing. You know, I, I really ever get a student here who can't write. You ever. mean you mean uh, writing essays? You, you write essays. Yes. essays. Yes. 
who, who can follow a line of thought, who yes. understand logic, who have, who put put arguments together, who understand what an organizing idea is and how to sequence something, who can bring different issues together and connect them. I mean, I, I, I find it quite amazing here. I mean, some of the best students I've ever taught in my life, and I taught for a long time, are in Canada. Some of the best students I've ever taught. Mm -hmm. uh, I but But again, Canada doesn't escape this neoliberal plague that's everywhere. I mean, you, because it seems to me as inequalities develop in countries like the U.S., but especially in places like Canada, which still cling to the social contract. Remember, in Canada, the social contract is still alive. Yet, when you have these inequalities in wealth and power developing, as they are in Canada, one of the fastest rising states, it's only a matter of time before the public goods, health, health care, education, increasingly uh, 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 deprived of resources. Mm -hmm. So it isn't as if Canada is some kind of panacea. Next to the U.S., it looks fabulous. Next to Switzerland, it looks pale. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, 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 it seems to me that it's somewhere in between. There's a balance here, at least, between education and the notion of the common good and the public good and what the purpose of education students should be. By, know, by, by um, a rising neoliberal culture, you mean uh, a corporate culture uh, entering uh, education? I, I, I don't just mean corporate culture entering education. I'm not just talking about the corporatization of education. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about an extreme form of capitalism of which corporatism is one part. And this has a particular set of values. It produces particular uh, policies. Uh, the values operate off the assumption that the market is not just something that in which you, you're concerned with the economy. The market now the, is a template for all of social life. It elevates self-interest to the level of a national ideal. It says that we're all in a war of competition with each other. It's a reality TV show endlessly magnified. There's only one person left on the island. It's a position that seems to suggest that privatization, commodification, and deregulation are all that matter. It also states that the corporate state is more important than the political state and it does and it does three things that are horrendous one is separates economic activity from social cost mm -hmm. that means it basically eliminates the question of ethics and social responsibility secondly it says that all problems are individual problems and when you tell people that all problems are individual problems they have no way of understanding how private interests become larger systemic interests and they get depoliticized are you still That's talking about canada I'm talking about any country in, in which neoliberalism is at play. Oh, yeah. it, it, it just exists in different forms mm -hmm. and with different levels of intensity, and it operates through different policies. The third, the third issue is, that, is around the question of translation. You know, if individuals can't translate the issues that they see in comprehensive, historical, political, relational ways, they get trapped, and they... They, they end up sort of adhering to simplistic answers. They look for strong men, men, right? Strong men. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they find themselves blaming blacks and immigrants, people on the border. You know, you have the, all of a sudden the walls go up everywhere. Uh, white supremacy begins to become fashionable, not just on the margins, but at the centers of power. And I, and I, and I think that neoliberalism is one of the great scourges of the 20th century. Well, let's move to uh, critical uh, pedagogy. I'm glad we could um, uh, avoid uh, the topic of Trump because uh, we've talked about it too much. He's gotten too much of a stage. So let's move on to uh, critical pedagogy. It started, um, that I know, when you were a high school teacher yourself. So um, let's go back to that moment. You were a high school teacher uh, in Rhode Island somewhere, I believe. Uh, in the 60s, you taught social studies and history. Um, first off, uh, how do you look back on your career as a high school teacher? You how did teach you find this stuff out? <laughs> Excuse me? How did you find this out? <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to uh, to to find that out because it's all on the McMaster. Actually, yeah, no, I, I was a high school teacher and uh, I was teaching... In, in, I was teaching in the 60s, and this is very important because in the 60s, I was teaching in a school that was uh, very progressive at the time. Which means? So, please? Uh, how, how did it show? 
Well, because, for instance, I could teach electives. I mean, I, I didn't just, there wasn't just, it, we, we were just teaching for the test. There wasn't this obsession with standardization. There wasn't this obsession with objectives. Teachers had some power. It was a middle-class community that believed that uh, its kids needed to think critically in order to go to the Ivy League schools and to be able to really prosper as, in all the ways that they imagined uh, that's that's how you define success. So, you know, I, I was teaching courses on alienation, teaching courses on feminism, and a whole range of other things, and also teaching different classes, working class kids, very poor, and at the same time, very rich, uh, upper, upper middle class kids. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember at the time, the, the one incident that changed my life, actually, we had a vice principal who was a military, ex-military person. And I had these kids sitting in a circle and he came, knocked on my door and he said, I don't want to see that anymore. I want straight rows. I want you up at the board, I, you know, and I tried to explain to him what I, what I was doing. And while the experience resonated for me as something that worked and was right, I didn't have a language. I had no theoretical language to basically uh, articulate what I was doing. And ironically that day, I went home and somebody had sent me a copy of Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. I read it that night and all of a sudden I had a language. And, and it wasn't, of course, it was a language. It, it wasn't a complete language. So it's never been complete. But I had a language in which to begin to theoretically defend what I was doing mm -hmm. and to understand more clearly uh, what it meant to talk about critical pedagogy and how that was important. Uh, and so that was a defining moment for me. I mean, I... I got in a lot of trouble in that school because I used to uh, rent films from the Quakers. Quakers? Were, you mean the religious, semi-religious? They, they the Quakers, they, they weren't just religious. They were, they were radical religious. Oh, I mean, okay, yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, they were, they were, they were, like, they were the, like the moon comp, sect. They were comparable to what we saw in Latin America, you know, these radical theologians, yeah. you know, which Paulo was part of. And, uh, and you know, the, the administration got very upset over that. Uh, and I used to use my own books. I, what I would do is I would buy books, five or six books, put them in the library, and then I could bypass being forced to have to buy books that the university, <laughs> that, the, that the high school agreed with. So my kids were reading stuff that nobody else was reading. Wow. <laughs> and so this is a very, for me, it, it was a pedagogically, it's a very exciting time because I was working through uh, what it meant to, to basically educate kids to be not only self-reflective and critical, but I was starting to understand the relationship between knowledge and power. You know, I was starting to understand the relationship between values and education. And I began to understand that education in pedagogy is always a struggle over agency. A struggle over agency. What kind of agents do you want to produce? Today, we say we produce agents for the global workforce. Yeah. Then we were saying, no, we want to produce eight kids who are provocative, yeah. who are radical, who, who take civic life seriously, and who want to fight for democracy. But yet, but yet, you had a curriculum to attend. You had objectives. What were those back in the days? No, actually, uh, actually, uh, believe it or not, at that time, they were not imposing a standardized set of objectives upon really? us. Really? No, they weren't doing it. I, this sounds like a, a, a utopian moment in American education, but but I did not bear under that dictate. Like not a, in that like like a Deweyite uh, philosophy. Exactly. You know what they wanted to know was they wanted to know was this course relevant? How did it uh, relate to the outside mm -hmm. world? Was it helpful for students in understanding themselves? Mm -hmm. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. They were okay. I mean, they you know they 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 got upset when they saw how it began to work out. <laughs> and what we were actually talking yeah. about critical remember, critical citizens yeah exactly <laughs> i mean you're getting students who all of a sudden yeah. were learning how to hold power accountable yeah, yeah. That's, that's dangerous as ahana Haran and everybody else has said i mean that's dangerous and but remember this is also the 60s it's in the midst of the vietnam war yeah. we're reading howard zinn we're reading wilhelm reich we're reading Ellen Willis, Stanley Aronowitz. I mean, we're reading, you know, really important work. And these kids are on fire. They're on fire. Because they're learning a language so at odds with their own lives <laughs> that this language is reinventing them. They're reinventing their own sense of agency. 
they're reinventing the narratives that basically will allow them to be self-reflective in a way in which they can question what I say, not just question the world in general. Authority became suspect. It didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, thrown out the window. It just became suspect yeah. as it should. Be, yeah. Right? But how, how did this critical education help students enter university? I mean, there were no SATs, I suppose, but no. there were certain entrance exams, or weren't there back in the 60s? No, 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 no they, 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 but they, they, we, we weren't, we, at that point, the, 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 we, we, weren't, we weren't teaching people for the exams. We, we were, the school was operating off the assumption that if you had a broad-based liberal curriculum, if you had a wide variety of diverse teachers, you'd be prepared for the exam. You know, you it's, it's, know something. It's so hard to wrap my mind around it. That it, such a no, thing. It's hard, it, it's hard to wrap our minds around it because basically the notion of testing has become an end in itself. Yeah, in the Netherlands as well. But I, but I think that what you have to realize, and I'm sure you do, is this is not just simply teaching for the test. This is this is code for legitimating pedagogies of oppression. These are pedagogies of oppression because they limit the imagination. Because they limit one's sense of agency. Yeah. They limit the ability in, in, in some way to for education to perform one of its most, I would say, important functions, which is its critical function. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, it does away with this, you know. Uh, and, you know, and, and so I carry that forward in my own career into, uh, into the university. And then a very different kind of trajectory developed for me, which has changed. Over the years. Well, let's let's go uh, back just um, fr from the moment you were uh, in a quarrel with your principal. The funny thing is, I, I've watched at least fifty interviews. So this moment where you talk about the quarrel, about the fight uh, with your principal, uh, I always think, uh, um, what if you had read the book before you quarrel, before your conversation, uh, and you actually had a language to defend your pedagogy, what would you have said to your principal? That your principal told you, Henry, why are you teaching in circles? Why are you being so innovative? Why, what are you doing? Why are you not teaching the, uh, the way everybody is teaching in this school? What would you have said? With I, the, would have, I would have said there's no virtue in turning students into robots. I would have said that the, the method that I'm using operates out of a, a set of assumptions about what the purpose of education is that are not only consistent, but are liberatory. Because it seems to me that at the heart of any pedagogical practice should be a central term, empowerment. And How do you empower your students here? How do you expand their capacities for understanding a whole range of questions, whether it's about moral witnessing, about history, about literature, about being in the world, about dealing with others, or about understanding that the connections that we make with each other are central for societies to to basically survive and how in, does how yes. does how does teaching in a circle contribute to that objective because it operates off the assumption that when you're voiceless you're powerless it operates off the assumption that uh, and, and to be in a circle is to be able to speak to have to have a measure of equality uh, in in some way that allows you to talk back to, to say to students, you're not cheap. You know, we're not putting you in a stall and, and you can't move. And all you can do is look up. And, you know, yeah. this is not a military barracks. I, I have no interest in militarizing education. And I have no interest in defining students as merely consumers. Because I think that when we do that, something tragic happens. We don't create students who can live in the world. We create students who think only in terms of being dependent upon others. And I didn't want to reproduce that level of dependency, but at the same time, I didn't want to surrender what it meant for to, to be directive, to intervene in the classroom. So that was the first start. You read the book. Then um, you wrote a review, which you sent to some kind of magazine. Uh, and the magazine... Uh, sent it to Paolo himself, yeah. and he yeah. was uh, rather impressed. And then you started uh, a friendship, a collaboration. So how did it go from from there on? Well, th this th 
this happened in the 19, uh, seven, late 70s. And uh, Paulo, Paulo wrote a letter to Interchange, which was the very famous Canadian journal, educational journal, and said, I would have published this yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and we started a collaboration. I wrote to him. I brought him to the United States in the 1981. Uh, he, he gave a number of talks at Boston University and other places. I introduced him to Donaldo Macedo, who became his translator and his friend as well, like myself. And then Paulo and I met with Bergen and uh, Jim Bergen, who had a press called uh, Bergen and Gavi, a little tiny press that was in his garage. That was it. It was in his garage. And we created a series called Critical Education and uh, uh, something and Pedagogy. I don't forget to say. And we published about 55 books together, Paulo and I. And we got 55 people tenure. Wow, 55 books? So at least, at least 55 books. At least we, 50. And that series went on for 12, 15 years until Paulo died. Uh, well, I'm surprised that we know so little of Paulo in the Western world. I mean, uh, when you talk about the Netherlands, for example, he is so unknown. Um, critical pedagogy is not an issue in the Netherlands. It's just like in America, we are so obsessed with uh, with standardized testing, punitive accountability. We don't have time to reflect. The, the, uh, I'm sitting here because I'm uh, sacrificing family time uh, to talk to you, which I really like, by the way. But I, uh, I, I, I would be correcting tests, preparing tests. I, I mean, you see what I mean? We don't yeah. have... So the system has a grip. I mean, we are in some kind of grip, grit, and it's so hard to escape. How how do you turn this system for the better? I mean, it, it, it seems to me there are a number of places to begin to talk about this, and that is, you know, we, we have to re-examine what exactly the purpose of schooling is. I mean, it's got to become a major international debate, and we need a, a movement, an international movement in defense of public goods. That's what we need. You know, we need to resurrect the relationship between public goods and democracy. And if democracy is going to work on a global scale, as opposed to these emerging right wing fascist movements that are everywhere, then we've got to recognize that politics follows culture, follows culture. What how people understand the world contributes to their politics and education is central to politics. So it seems to me we have to redefine education on the basis of what it means to expand the capacity for people to be critically engaged agents. That's absolutely crucial. Secondly, we need to talk about the control and the power that teachers have over the conditions of their own labor. You know, this managerial model, this top mm -hmm. the bottom model that imposes on you and me and other teachers demands that basically undercut not only our creativity, but impose elements of a pedagogy of repression that is ant antithetical to what we believe. You know, when I have 500 students in a room, I'm sorry, you know, don't tell me that's about critical pedagogy. You know, don't, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know that, that means be a good entertainer, yeah. right? Be able to tell jokes make them laugh, get them involved. But that's not critical pedagogy. What are the material conditions that make this kind of learning possible? We need more resources. We need to pay educators as much as we pay the highest professionals in a society. And my, my argument is teachers are a civic treasure, a treasure. Because if we education may be one of the few public spheres left where you can actually talk about ideas, where we don't have to see an advertisement blanking on the side of the screen telling me to buy a BMW. Uh, so it, it, it seems to me, third, fourthly, we can't do this alone. You know, you can't say, I'm going to close my door, I'm going to, in a stealth-like fashion, implement elements of, 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 of progressive pedagogy, and then it'll be fine. Can't do it. Teachers have to unite. They have to organize collectively, and they can't just organize within their unions. They have to link themselves up with social movements. We've seen this, particularly in the United States. I mean, we saw last year where teachers were walking out all over the country, you know, protesting, all, everything from school violence to not mm -hmm. being paid adequately, to having no control over their labor. And we saw it by students. We saw students walking endlessly out of schools, protesting gun violence and linking up with students in other countries. 
you know, the Black Lives Movement, trying to figure out, you know, what schools really should be doing mm -hmm. as opposed to what they are doing. And you miraculously, know, the, miraculously, there is the corona crisis, which has silenced exactly. virtually all groups. There are no protests because you're not allowed to protest. The police well, will... That, that, that's not entirely true, right? With, with George Floyd, there were massive pro uh, protests. There were, During, yes. There were massive protests. And those protests are still going on, many of them. Uh, but, but, you know, let's be honest, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the coronavirus has put a damper. It mm. seems to have put a damper on every group except the far right. They, they seem to, they don't believe the coronavirus exists. They think it's like the flu. They think it's, a, it's something that the deep state has created mm -hmm. uh, because uh, eventually they'll want to be vaccinated they'll have to take a vaccine and there's a secret chip in the vaccine that will uh, allow people, the government to follow them around. I mean, they're completely crazy, but it, 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 yeah, you're right. I mean, this is, this is a dangerous time in terms of putting a damper on protest movement, but it's also an exciting time because it's made visible in profound ways, uh, enormous inequities and inequalities that have to be addressed. You always talk about Having a language, a narrative, which allows teachers to express themselves. But when I read this book and when I read your book, it's not easy reading. It's not an easy narrative. I mean, how how do I uh, master uh, this narrative? Where do I start as a teacher? Because it depends. It depends on where you begin. That book, uh, which is the first edition, mine. Uh, uh, Yours is, is 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 the second half of the second edition is interviews and they're very yeah. accessible. Yeah. But the other the other side of this is maybe you've asked the wrong question. You know, maybe the question should be, you know, since various academics write at, at, in in different venues and in different levels for different audiences, where, 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 where given the audience that I represent, where should I begin? And I would say, look, I write for Truth Out. I write for Counterpunch. I write for a number of online journals. I have a site, uh, a homepage, and you can go, as you well know, you can go to any of those places. Those articles are enormously accessible. And and I, and without lacking, I hope, the rigor that I think is necessary to inform them. The, some of the scholarly books may not be the place to begin for people who are starting. But, for, but there are abundant resources, it seems to me, and particularly around critical pedagogy. There are a lot of people who write about critical pedagogy, and there are a lot of people who are very accessible. Powell's work uh, initially was very hard, but when you read Pedagogy of Freedom or a number of other things that are really quite different. His interviews, for instance, I, I when I approach any theorist, the first thing I read are their interviews. I don't read their books. I read their interviews. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to get a sense of what the project is. Then I go to the books. Um. Um, one of the lines that come up in your interview a lot and in Noam Chomsky's interview a lot is uh, speaking truth uh, to power and um, how would you um, uh, motivate teachers to speak truth to power because as you know we are in a punitive system we are in some kind of grid. We are captives uh, in a very a hostile system. I, I mean, for it's easy for a Noam Chomsky, it's easy for an Henri Giroud to speak truth to power. But for me, and for my colleagues, where do you start? How do you do it? I think you start with the recognition that things don't have to be the way they are. And I don't mean to be facile. I mean, I think that's important. I think the last thing you want to do is normalize the conditions under which we find ourselves and believe that there's no way out. And then what happens is when you don't have hope, you don't have a sense of agency. When you don't have agency, you don't have a sense of hope. And it, and it seems to me you have to imagine that things can change. And you do that by making visible the forces that don't allow you to, to change. And then you, we try to figure out what we can do uh, to make those changes realizable, even under the worst conditions. In the most oppressive conditions of domination, people have resisted. They've resisted. And, and, I, and I think that we have to be energized by a sense of hope and courage. Courage. You know, look, uh, you may be fired. You know, you, you know, it may be hard, but it's, it's, it's worth 
the effort because I don't want to stay in a system that treats me like a fourth class citizen. I don't want to teach in a school where I'm not really teaching and I'm not really performing. I'm just an obedient cog. Uh, you know, you have to you have to learn how to fight back. You have to fight back. You have no choice. And without learning how to fight back and without having the courage to fight back, you fall into a kind of cynicism that unfortunately, and I don't mean to be harsh, makes us complicitous with the very forces that in what, fact we need. What do you say to all those associate professors who work contracts uh, to contracts uh, two year contracts and then you know uh, what do you say to them i mean it's easy for tenured um, uh, professors to speak out like you do but what if you don't no, have... it, 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 being tenured doesn't guarantee anything i think that's a i think that's a myth i want to challenge that first being tenured means you have more spaces and, and less you have you have uh, less insecurities but being tenured doesn't guarantee anything it doesn't guarantee it. You're going to take. You're going to be courageous. It doesn't guarantee you're you're going to take a chance to, and, and might be fired. It doesn't guarantee that at all. But I think it does uh, impose a larger responsibility to speak up. That's for sure. What I say to those people who are contracted, I say, hey, look, you've got to join with tenured people, and you've got to join with communities, and you've got to make visible how the system works to, to, to turn 70% of the faculty, in, particularly in the United States, into temporary workers. And that that doesn't work for anybody. It doesn't work for you. It doesn't work for students. And all it does is benefit the managerial class, the neoliberal university. If, you know, one of the great successes of dominant power is to make power invisible. It makes its own power invisible. So that we say, oh, people are on contract uh, wages because they're not smart enough. Or they like, they like only working, uh, you know, teaching one course a week. Uh, or mm -hmm. they don't mind teaching in four or five places. It's fun to travel. You see where I'm going with this, right? And it, and it seems to me that the, the the greatest deprivation that contract workers face is that time is no longer a luxury. It's a deprivation. It's a deprivation. When you're struggling to survive, it's hard to think about politics in the most fundamental way. It becomes kind of a luxury. And that's why organizations have developed, certainly in the United States, and I don't know how many other countries, where contract workers are now organizing. And they're saying, hey, look, you could have shut the university down. Shut it down. You know, don't show up for two days. You know, they're not going to fire all of us. You know, align with unions that, uh, that basically are going through the same restructuring, by the way. So the real question here is how is the restructuring that is affecting casual workers in the United States, in the Netherlands, and in other places, how does that cut across a whole range of, of groups where they can say, that's enough? That's enough. What we need to do is we need direct action. We, you need to stop the economy. You need to stop the, these institutions from performing. And believe me, they respond. They respond. You shut a school down, they respond. You shut a nation's school down, mm -hmm. they don't have a choice anymore. So it seems to me you have to, as C. Wright Mills says, you have to think big. How do I raise critical thinking students when I have a very rigid standardized testing schedule? How would you do it? I, I think you do it in three ways. One, I think whenever you're teaching that shit, I, I think you you try to you you bring in modes of analysis that that makes it very clear how limiting it is. You know, you try to connect with the histories and the cultures that they bring to that classroom. And you try to introduce them to work that they can use outside of the, the formalized curriculum. Uh, you try to show them films, any space you have in that curriculum where you can add a moment of resistance, it seems to me works. It works. And sometimes it'll change a kid in a moment, in a moment. Thirdly, it seems to me, I think we need to address the fundamental question that education doesn't just take place in schools. For many of these kids, it takes place outside of schools. And we can direct them to resources where they can be educated in ways to learn mm -hmm. how to challenge actually the conditions under which you labor. Yeah, I think you're right about uh, bringing them in contact with within the curriculum. Um, uh, for example, a few weeks ago, I watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix. It's uh, uh, about the, the influence of social media on the way students behave. And I think there was a 
uh, that gave them some valu valuable insights, even within our rigid testing schedule. So there are ways uh, to do. Oh that. no, no. They, they, I, I think the mistake that we make uh, is, is that we succumb to a method that we think is so all-encompassing in the way in which it's directing us that we we stop figuring out ways to subvert it. And that becomes a form of self-sabotage. You understand, mm -hmm. right? It becomes, because I don't want to think, when I taught that some of that stuff uh, in the first school was not in Barrington. The first school was in a very rigid school I taught. Uh, I was always trying to find ways to subvert that curriculum. Always. And, and it worked. Because students are not stupid. They're not stupid. They know when they're, they're learning stuff that is boring and, and absolutely mind-numbing. And all of a sudden, you're talking about social media? Whoa. Yeah. I mean, that's like sex, you know? I mean, it's like, wow, what just happened here? Yeah. And, and I, I think that's very important. We, we need to be inventive even under the most oppressive conditions. In the Netherlands, we are slaves of the method. We have a method of English. It consists of eight chapters, so we have eight tests, and then we go to the next book. It consists of eight chapters, and it, so we do eight tests, and we go from method to method. It's the big, uh, the big corporates uh, above education that decides what we teach. It's it's like that. No, that's that's a pedagogy of oppression. Yeah, and, and I I think it needs to be named, and I, I think it. The, the, the fundamental question that has to be asked here is, you know, what kind of society do you want to invent for children? Do you want to construct for children? Do you want to, do you want to construct a society where the only thing that they know about education is that, is that it's, it's all about, it's, it's a methodological issue and nothing more? You know, oh, I, you know, you're having a bad time in class? Feed them M&Ms. You know, you're having a bad time in class? Let's be Rogerian. Mm -hmm. You know, these are questions that are not... The fundamental questions of education are not solved through methods, you know, right? I mean, yeah. methods can't answer questions about inequality. Methods can't answer questions about how, what a comprehensive pedagogy looks like. Methods can't answer questions about the the, the uh, opportunity to teach kids how to be moral witnesses, no, but to be responsible. My, but my school doesn't care. The method teaches them how to speak English, and that's the sole objective. For my class, well, I, I I think that we have a responsibility to make it clear that the language that they learn is about more than technical skills. If they really want to learn that language in a way that empowers them, says right? who? Says who? I mean, my principal um, expects me to um, you know gain nice results. No, critical students, it's just a nice side effect if it happens. But I mean, they don't care. It's not important. I mean, I think that the, the issue of they're not caring is not an issue about them. It's about a condition in which they find themselves that has to be changed, right? Yeah. I, I think it's too easy to say students just don't care and I'm trapped. You know, because you're blaming students when you say that. When in fact, the real cause of that problem is not the student society that treats them like cogs. It's an educational system that's been reduced to simply methodological, methodological madness and treats all teachers as if they're accountants. You're an accountant, and I'm not an accountant. I'm sorry. You know, when I, I I don't just shape, I don't just shop in pencils all day. Uh, and so this this the the, the 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 entire political theoretical model that informs that that stuff has got to be challenged. It can't be just challenged at the level of students who were born into it, because that's very interesting. Because then you stop blaming students. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. 55 books down the road together with Paulo Freire. Where are we now today? So we talked about the past, how, how it all started. Where are we now with critical pedagogy? Well, I think that, I think that critical pedagogy has certainly taken off all over the world. I mean, there, it's certainly more well-known than it was in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, I think there's an enormous pushback against notions of critical pedagogy. I, but, I, but I think it... Uh, it, it harbors a, a lot of dangerous potential. And I, and I think the real issue is to push as hard as we can to educate people in ways that, uh, you know, address its most fundamental questions and see how they can be translated into ways that might be operative for what they're doing as educators. What do you mean? But by, I also, what do you mean by? But I also, 
What do you mean by dangerous potential? Dangerous for the oppress think, oppressors? I think it's dangerous for, for, for schools. I think it's dangerous for mm -hmm. governments. Mm -hmm. You're thinking it's dangerous. I mean, let's be realistic. You know, I mean, to, to educate students to be critical is it, to, to educate them to ask the questions that people don't want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, and, and not only that, uh, to teach in a class of kids who are critical uh, <laughs> means that you can't just simply teach by a script. You have to be fast. You have to know something. You have to respond. You have to be responsible. I mean, you know, it, it redefines what it means to be an educator. Uh, and for many, for some teachers, that's very dangerous. And it's very threatening. And it's certainly threatening in many ways for school systems. I mean, I'll give you one small example. Uh, two examples, really. You know, Jeb Bush, George Bush's uh, brother, yes. when he was governor of Florida, they passed a law. And the law was that social studies teachers in the high schools could teach facts in history, the social science, but they couldn't teach interpretation. <laughs> I mean, think about this. Yeah. Right? Right? And then think about Trump. I'm sorry, we have to measure, <laughs> mention. I mean, Trump recently claiming that before you know, he lost, he wanted to impose patriotic education in the schools. All right, which means? Which means you learn to celebrate capitalism you learn to celebrate authority you learn to really? conform to you celebrate. don't ask critical well i'll give you an example i mean the new york times had a project called the 1619 project which you wanted a beautiful project it, it, the, the implication being in 1619 slavery begins in the in, in america and we need to learn about slavery we need to learn about this past it's been erased yes. trump said that was seditious uh, that, that distorted American history and should be expunged from the schools. Wow. That's patriotic education. Wow. Patriotic education is like what we saw in Argentina and, and in Chile under Pinochet. It's about the politics of disappearance. The things that matter disappear. The teachers that matter disappear. The ideas that matter disappear. And ultimately, at the end of that cycle, in a fascist mindset, bodies disappear. That's amazing. Noam Chomsky mentioned a situation in his book, Chomsky on Mi Miseducation, about a boy who refused to salute when they were raising the flag and singing uh, the American uh, anthem, and the boy was expelled from school because he didn't re respect the American flag. It's, oh, it's... There, there, are endless, there are endless stories about that. Endless. I mean, there are stories about, look, you, you, you could have put that argument in a wider context. And the context goes like this. As the punishing state increases and the social state decreases, rather than dealing with social problems in ways that matter, we criminalize those social problems so that young people in schools who, for instance, uh, uh, violate a dress code. In the past, we would say, pull your pants up, right? Now we call the police and we come in. We handcuff these kids, yeah. referring to zero tolerance policies, and we take them off the court where they have a criminal record for the mm -hmm. rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that most of those kids are black and brown. So we've militarized the schools. We've turned social problems into criminal acts. A kid who basically uh, has a toy gun is expelled from school because that's considered a, a potential weapon. Yeah, yeah, it symbolizes, yeah. a, it goes on and on. It, it reminds me of Michael Moore's documentary, Bowling for Columbine, in which yeah. he uh, talks about uh, the Columbine high school shooting. And after the high school shooting, schools were turned into prisons and yeah. carrying uh, toy guns was not allowed. And you were expelled for, for a whole school year because uh, you were a potential danger. So that's right. still it's still going on like that. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, yeah, I mean, look, when, when, when the emphasis on the welfare state and the social contract disappears, when you have a society dominated by techniques and methods and the accumulation of capital, uh, when you have a society that says that human beings really don't count and most of them are losers because they're not in the upper 1%, mm -hmm. why would you treat public schools with any dignity? That makes no sense, right? I mean, because dignity is not a, a value that matters in, in yeah. fascist societies. It doesn't matter. And neoliberalism has now become a form of fascist politics. It's no longer just neoliberalism. 
Now it, it, it aligns itself with white supremacy, white nationalism, mm -hmm. and it believes that the public sphere should only be inhabited by white people. So you have a different political formation that's emerged out of neoliberalism, which makes schools even more dangerous places to be, to be for many kids, particularly kids of color, particularly immigrants. So you talked about hope, and you see that people are uh, protesting, are coming together. Um, so I noticed that as well in Belarusia and uh, Iran, very dangerous countries where people have the guts to protest, but still, the regimes are still in place. So do you have any examples of regime change uh, because of brave people like teachers? Yeah, I do, of course. Oh, like Cuba. Cuba, absolutely. Nobody wants to talk. Let's talk about Cuba. Okay. Let's talk, let's talk about a society where COVID is non-existent at the moment. Let's talk, let's talk about a society where education is central to what it means to be uh, 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 critically informed. Let's talk about a society where inequality has been almost eliminated. But, let's talk but Cuba, I mean, it changed because Fidel died. Or is, is it didn't change because Fidel died? It changed because Batista was overthrown. I'm sorry. No, it didn't change because Castro died. It changed because capitalism, which was using the island mm -hmm. as simply a resource for basically the mafia and, and corporate elitists to drain its resources. That's how it changed. Now, Be look, because we, we can say we can say well, there are moments of oppression in Cuba. Of course, there were, and they need to be addressed. Nobody's denying that. But I'll tell you this. When it comes to three kinds of freedoms, political freedom, personal freedoms, liberties, and economic freedom, the first two are meaningless unless you have economic freedom. They're meaningless. You know, you live under a bridge and you're homeless. What does it mean to vote? Anything? No. What does it mean to say, well, you have the right to congregate? You're a, you're a young man. You're teaching in a school. The lesson I hear from you is you have a school that's relatively oppressive. You're unhappy with your teaching. There are too many restrictions. And people will say, but at least you live in the Netherlands. I mean, this is like, wow, a lot of civil liberties, a lot of political mm -hmm. liberties. But you have no control over the conditions of your labor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, um, let's move to the future of a critical pedagogy. So who are today's stars in critical pedagogy? You laid the grounds together with Paolo and Donaldo and a couple of other names, but you are the first generation. Who is the next generation? Oh, there are many people. I mean, there's Antonio Dada, who is brilliant. There's Kenneth Saltman, who, uh, who is brilliant. Uh, there are a number of young people who are, who are carrying. Peter Mayo It is an enormously... Oriana Filipaco uh, uh, in Greece is brilliant, is writing about this stuff. There are many people who, 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 who have come along. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I was born after Lincoln died. I mean, I, you know, I, if they can read my work and it helps, they, they, in many ways, they far advance my work. I mean, these are, this is a younger generation, it's very smart, knows about the media, has an expanded understanding of history. Uh, I'm very proud of this generation. I mean, I think that they, uh, there's going to be a lot of changes in light of education in light all over the world in light of what they're doing. So we should connect all these bright voices. Where, where, where is the starting point for any teacher who wants to learn about critical pedagogy? Where, where do we go? I, I, I think... The first thing to, to do is to learn about the literature, you know, to go and just Google it or get it on, online. I mean, there's an abundance of literature online about this stuff that uh, pe people have enormous misconceptions about what critical pedagogy is because the dominant media often defines what it's not. Right. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I see references to my work in the dominant media that are just insane. I mean, I picked up a book a few years ago by Derek Bach, uh, the former president of Harvard, who said, this guy, this is terrible stuff, critical pedagogy, it's all about indoctrination. I couldn't, I was shocked. I, president of Harvard University, who buy into, you know, this kind of nonsense that uh, critical pedagogy is just an adjunct, a, a form of political indoctrination. Mm -hmm. The implication being, of course, as you know, that education has nothing to do with politics. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you say that, then you you know you refuse that. 
then you're indoctrinating students. Uh, but I, but I think that uh, again, you know, I, I have two thoughts in mind, and I'm not sure how relevant they are. But I, I think that you know we're in the midst. You know, you know the old saying by Gramsci, right? That the old is dying and the new is being born, and in the middle there's the potential for barbarism and hope. That's basically the the, the paraphrase. And, and I think that what COVID has done is it has resurrected a notion of the social that would never have appeared in the next 10 years. The need for public health, the need to work together, you know, the need for justice, the need for compassion, the need to understand how racism has now become enormously institu institutionalized, the need to cut back on the, on the punishing state, the need to resurrect public goods in the name of justice and hope. We, we're seeing a revitalization of the relationship between education and justice. And I see that as an enormously good sign, i.e. meaning that for justice to matter, you have to be educated about what injustice is. Is there a critical pedagogy movement such as thing as? I think there are movements per se. I don't think there's an international movement that has brought all of these together. I know, I know Bourdieu, before he died, wanted to create an international movement in defense of public goods. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. But there is no, uh, particularly in the last year, where COVID intervened, where a number of conferences were on the agenda to bring these people together. They've all been, now it's, we're, we're, we're all in a, hanging in the balance here to see where this goes. Because you agree with me that the most important challenges of our time are a nation, worldwide challenges, like fighting the corporate states, climate change, xenophobia. Um, it needs a global uh, pedagogy in order to... I, I completely agree with ...to that. raise I, awareness, uh, right? We are I fighting global I, forces... So we should unite somehow. No, I completely agree with that. Completely. We need a global pedagogy. That's right. You're absolutely right. We need a global pedagogy to create a global movement. And, and certainly in light of what Chomsky says around the three most pressing uh, uh, threats that we face, climate change, the potential for a nuclear war, and the decrease of democracy all over the world, yeah. <clears throat> among, among others. And of course, for me, the fourth would be uh, economic inequality, yeah. massive degrees of economic inequality. Yeah, the top one percent still yeah, keeps gaining huge amounts of money. For, Even one, one, three, three families in the United States own as much as half the the population. That, that's 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 <laughs> that's not unjust. That's more it's obscene. Yeah, yeah, it is. So uh, I have a few heroes when it comes to public intellectuals. I'm I'm just wondering what your opinion is about them. The first one, you just wrote an article on Twitter about uh, in honor of Noam Chomsky's birthday. He, he just turned 92. So what's your relationship with Noam Chomsky? What does he mean to you? Uh, I, I, I've known Noam for a long time. I, I, I never met him. <laughs> uh, but, but when I was at BU and I was denied tenure, he was one of the people who came to my defense. We've been in contact over many, many years. I, I read him. I wrote an introduction for one of his books. Yeah. I, 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 of course, uh, I read him diligently. You, uh, you are on the back of this book, actually, Chomsky on Miseducation. Here's, here's your story, your, um, your review of, uh, of his book. It's on the back of uh, Chomsky. So... No, I think that I, I, you know, I just, you know, I, you know, I wrote the, I just wrote a piece on celebrating him. I mean, I, I think he's a national treasure. You know, I mean, I think he's brave, he's courageous. I mean, later in his life, he, he went to Turkey to defend a, a dissident. He could have been shot and killed. Yeah. Noam is a Noam is a brave guy. I, I mean, Noam, Noam speaks about <laughs> issues that matter. Uh, he's been consistent all of his life. Yeah. He, he doesn't view himself as a celebrity. Uh, he, he's not self-indulgent. He's a public intellectual. He's compassionate. Uh, what, do you, what do you say about that? I mean, yeah, he doesn't really. He doesn't really have an equal uh, today. I, I, I'm surprised. Uh, his his rigid interview schedule. He 
I see a new interview every single week and he still um, isn't too proud to do an interview with me or some other unknown teacher or uh, it, it, he doesn't care. He just has a message and he thinks uh, I'm as important as a reporter from D Democracy Now, for example. And yeah. that's, uh, that's amazing. No, no, he, he, he's very generous. I, I mean, I think that generosity is a virtue that any public intellectual cannot afford to uh, not have. But do, do you have any other public inter intellectuals that have your interest at this moment? Well, Sigmund Bauman was an enormous influence on my life. And Are you kidding me? Sigmund Bauman? I, Sigmund Bauman was far more influential for me than Noam Chomsky. <clears throat> C. Wright Mills is far more influential than a lot of other people. Stanley Aronowitz, who is still alive, though he's ill now, uh, a, a towering intellectual. Ellen Willis, a towering intellectual. I mean, my my heroes are people who basically come from another generation. I mean, they're, they're pe meaning that that generation did not think compartmentally. It didn't think in fragments. Adorno, Horkheimer, they thought in terms of huge comprehensive bodies of knowledge. They were border crosses. They ignored the walls. They thought in, 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 in an interdisciplinary fashion. Howard Zinn was my friend, was also a, a good friend, uh, a, a very important public intellectual for me. What about Christopher Hitchens? Have you met him? Oh, Christopher Hitchens? I, I never met him. I didn't like where he went at the end. I thought he became a reactionary. Okay. And uh, the, the last person I really find interesting is Diane Ravitch, what do you think of her work? Uh, I, I think Diane is brave. I, she used to be a, a right-wing ideologue. She did a lot of damage to public education in the early part of her career when she worked for Ronald Reagan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I admire her for being able to, to turn around and uh, to That's take it. education seriously. That's it. And I took this book because exactly what you said. Huh? She, she was... Um, responsible, uh, amongst others, for No Child Left Behind during the Bush administration, which was a disaster. But she was cour courageous enough to say, wait a minute, this is not yep. what we aimed for. We should stop this now. And uh, I mean, I, I think that you really have to celebrate Diane for having, having the courage to step outside of the halls of power. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. She so, stepped outside the corridors of power and basically became an anathema yeah. to that group. Yeah, yeah. They hate it. But, you know, that's courageous. I, I, I think that's fabulous. And I think her work now is very important. When was the last time you changed your mind? I want to think that I changed my mind a lot. On an important topic like uh, No Child Left Behind. I'm not, I mean, not dinner, yesterday's dinner, but I mean big topics. No, I, I, I find myself, I don't think, I, I think it's the wrong question. I don't think the issue is, when's the last time I changed my mind? I think the issue is, that I ever stopped being self-reflective? And I want to hope I didn't. One of my last questions is, uh, what's next for you? We talked about the future of critical pedagogy, but I mean, uh, you have a respectable age. Some people retire at your age. What's your plan for the future? I'm going to get married to a woman I love. And I'm going to keep fighting. To keep fighting for? For justice, for democracy, uh, and for making the world a better place where people don't have to suffer and go hungry and, uh, and live with dignity. Great. Uh, I'm a musician by trade. And my, uh, my life is all about music. I, I studied flamenco guitar. That's my profession. I, I went. I love flamenco. Yeah, yeah. So um, music... Uh, is very important. It defines me, and uh, I noticed that music is important for many people. It must be important for you too. So, if you it changed have... my life, it changed my life. How? I, I was a white working class kid. It was a shoe shine boy in the nineteen fifties, and I used to shine uh, shoes in black clubs. And I met Fats Domino. I heard Billie Holiday. Really? Uh, uh, I I, uh, I I sat in the back of a black church and listened to music. And uh, the first black musician I heard that changed my life romantically was Etta James. Well, so so my, some music is very important to me. I, I can't imagine a life without music. I can't imagine. If, if you have to describe uh, yourself in three musical pieces, what are the most important uh, songs to you? 
Billy Holiday's Strange Fruit, a uh, Strange Fruit, uh, Etta James, Fool That I Am, uh, Gato Barberi, Europa, uh, and of course Miles Davis, the, the album Kind of Blue. Nice taste, nice taste. I agree. <laughs> and uh, how about literature? Three books. I like Philip Roth. You know, Philip Roth speaks to me. Uh, I, I don't read Tony Morrison. I read. I read Philip Roth. To, to be honest, I don't read a lot of literature. I should read more. I, I find myself reading a lot of scholarly work, uh, mm. and it's a choice. A choice I've made. You know, I. But Philip Roth t speaks to me in a way I like. I like one of the moments in one of your many interviews that you said that you talked about Paulo Freire when you were when you were visiting someone and he said the food is not good in here. We should get out here as soon as possible. So he was a food lover. I mean, oh, uh, does it? Do you have the same uh, stance toward food? I mean, if you have to. No, I, I have I have a great appreciation for food, but I've made one tragic mistake in my life. Very tragic. I never learned how to cook. All right. So you you go out for dinner. So what's your your? Uh... Well, I, I I love Portuguese food. Uh, you know, I love a variety of foods. I, I I'm I'm not crazy about Indian food because for a variety of reasons. But uh, <laughs> but food is very important. As food to me is part of those that element you include in what you would call an important circle of sensuality. And now you're getting married, so you are going to be a good husband who is able to cook. So you will. I have absolutely. <laughs> Great. My very last question is: uh, Who should I interview next? Uh, who interview is Ken Saltman. Why? He's at the uni University of Berlin because he's smart, he's brilliant, and he writes about elements of critical pedagogy and education that are on the cutting edge with new technologies and social media. Uh, he's a really smart guy. Or if you want, you could interview Donaldo Macedo. Yeah, yeah, I wrote him an email, I think, uh, three years ago, but uh, I should do it again. Especially... Do it again. Tell him, tell him you've interviewed me and I recommended it. Yeah, and Noam Chomsky, of course. Uh, so maybe that, uh, that that helps. Let okay. me end by uh, saying uh, many thanks for your very generous uh, uh, time uh, you spent with me. So um, thank you. You you are an inspiration for me, just like Noam Chomsky and Donaldo. And be sure that I will do everything in within my power to to um, promote critical pedagogy and let's see what we can do to to establish a worldwide network i will no, i will contact the main players within critical pedagogy like donaldo to see if we can establish some kind of network sure. because i think it's essential that we do in order as an antidote to all those big forces uh, in the I mean world. there are other, I mean there are people i haven't mentioned there's Sheila McCrane there's Shirley Steinberg I mean, there's a lot of people. The, the, the other thing is, what will happen? Is this is this a video that we're doing? I don't even know. Or is this an I, audio? Well, I have recorded this. Yes, this is a video. Uh, I write articles, which I share on my website. So it will be an article. And with your permission, I will publish this uh, video. Okay, you bet. Okay, send me a link when you do. I will. So thanks again for your time. I hope you have a nice Christmas. Uh, so and, do you. And enjoy uh, the excellent music you listen to. All right. Goodbye. All right. See you next time. Bye.